Yeah, thank you very much for having us. Um, yes, so what we're going to do today is talk about Flink. And uh, most of you are maybe familiar with like typical frameworks to handle big data, uh, data loads like Spark and, and others. And Flink, even though it's been around for a while, hasn't really made it to the center stage until recently. And we're going to talk to you about the advantages of this framework and what use cases can be really, really well and elegantly solved with Flink. So generally, just to uh, start things off, let's look at what Flink actually is. So of course, like many of these frameworks, it was incubated at university, but not in the United States, but in Germany. At, uh, as part of a stratosphere project at Berlin University, Flink was incubated eventually in 2014 as an Apache top-level pro uh, uh, project and further developed by obviously a companion company called back, the back then Data Artisans. Now they're called Vervica, and they're heavily involved, especially with the folks from Alibaba. Flink, and the major thing about Flink, was, which is different, is it is a stream-first framework. And for that, it basically takes unbound data streams and give uh, the ability to do stateful computation on top of those streams. What's great about Flink is that it also uses a very simple data flow model, right? It's just basically the kind of typical, let's say, stream topology uh, approach. You basically have streams and transformations. So an incoming stream, there's a transformation, and an outgoing stream. So essentially, the concept is basically having processors that can take one or multiple streams in, do some transformation on, on them, and then output them to other streams. Very simplistic approach. So, and what's also uh, specific and interesting about Flink is that it is streaming first, right? So generally, everything is a stream, and everything uh, that we try to do is specifically designed to operate on top of that stream construct, con um, concept, right? And in order to facilitate things, we basically have the directed acyclical graph model, and uh, this allows us to organize data flows that can be branched or merged within an application scope. And of course, this is the data world, so uh, any framework, any basically any library needs to have proper integrations with many different systems, because otherwise, what's the value? And Flink does that too, so it has integrations to Kafka for Google Cloud Pub Sub and other streaming um, brokers. It can support Debezium as an input. Also has support for the common data models like um, frameworks, like uh, formats like Parquet, JSON, ORC, Avro, and so on. And it works also with, let's say, Hadoop environments. It was specifically designed to bring streaming capabilities to the data platform world. And also in the world of stores, we've got support for MongoDB, Dynamo, Cassandra, Post, Postgres, and all the other JDBC contenders. So it's really, really a good pluggable implementation of a streaming framework. Of course, many people will say, yet another framework, right? We've got Spark, we've got maybe also, like, that's the, 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 the big uh, contender in that space, right? So what are the differences be between Spark and Flink? So Flink, because it's stream first, it expresses data flows as streams, and when it does have to do the batch computation, it just uses windowing, right? So it's like, okay, we're gonna wait for this amount of, like this, these amounts of records or that amount of time, and we're gonna do a batch computation within the stream as a window function. Spark is pretty much the opposite, right? It's a batch-oriented framework. It was designed for the world of batch. It's also older by a couple of years. And uh, when streams became important, it said, okay, how can we handle streams? Well, we're gonna micro-batch, right? And that's how Spark does, especially in Spark streaming, handles streams from its batch nature. Both, otherwise, are quite similar. They have a SQL abstraction layer. So you can express SQL on your workloads. It has stateless and stateful computation, support and functions. They integrate sources and syncs with all the typical inputs and outputs and formats that we know. And both have excellent clustering and scaling capabilities, right? So basically, because we're talking data, it abstracts away the problem of 
scaling a program and distributing programs, right? Both of them are very good at that. And similar to Spark, it also has multiple APIs that are built on top of each other. So at the lowest level, you have the data stream API, which is essentially a set of, of functions that can operate on streams, right? And, and that is also the oldest of the APIs, and it is also the most low-level one. Then on top of that, you have table API, which basically offers an abstraction, and again, at the as highest level, SQL, a SQL implementation. So data stream API, as mentioned, offers the most powerful API. It, can, it provides a transformations in pipelines. It has higher order functions as we expect them. It also ex exposes Flink's building block, blocks. The disadvantage is also more complex, right? You need a better understanding of Flink to use it. And uh, you can't really execute SQL as easily uh, in a data stream API because you have to code a lot more. The table API is an abstraction on top of that. And it basically says a stream is like a table. We're just basically exposing a table. And you can do computations on that table and uh, representation for batch and streaming workloads, regardless of what it is. It's fully managed by Flink. And you can also convert between the data stream API and the, and, the, uh, and the table API. And lastly, we have the SQL API. And that's what we want to focus our talk on today. Because essentially, let's say the computation of the stuff that we can do with data stream and tables is also similar to other, um, let's say, processing frameworks. But SQL is, offers a real simplification of workloads, the ability to create a statement that will execute the aggregations and functions that you want, right? And also provide the ability to embed UDFs within your statements. So without much further ado, I will hand over to Vito, who will basically give you an insight on how to use SQL. Is it working? Yes. OK, awesome. Uh, my name is Vitor. I am a software developer at HiveMind. And my job essentially is to entice you to Flink. And the way I'm going to do this is by demonstrating a use case we had our company uh, for Flink. So a couple months ago, we had to essentially eagerly materialize over, uh, say, 500 SQL Server views. And I'll demonstrate what, what we mean by eagerly. So uh, just like a quick recap, recap on uh, views. I think everyone knows this. But uh, regular views, essentially, they don't store anything. <coughs> There's no state. Right? Your query is essentially stored query. Uh, and then you have a step up, which is the materialized view, which is a little bit better because you query the view, and then the state is, uh, is then saved, is cached. And then once you access it again, you don't have to recompute or reprocess the whole view again. Um, you also need to refresh it manually, but this is essentially um, generalizing because uh, Postgres, for example, has uh, you have the ability to refresh uh, um, when a transaction happens. Uh, that changes the, the updates, the base tables, or the underlying tables of the view. But this is just a generalization, essentially. So, but the problem is that um, that was not enough. Materialized views was not enough for this uh, project that we had a couple months ago. Um, because we had a lot, a lot of views that we had to eagerly materialize. I'm talking about 700. Um, and the problem with Refreshing views is that whenever you need to access new data, uh, you have to recompute the whole view. And sometimes that's not necessary, right? Sometimes you have um, a base table changes, but you only affect one row. So you only have one row that is stale, right? So essentially what we want to do is incrementally materialize the view. That's what I mean by eagerly materialize the view. Right? So if one row changed in the view, we want to only update that row, nothing else. We don't want to recompute the whole view again because that's very expensive. There's also another um, problem, uh, something that we had to do for the project, which is quite interesting. We had to also have a changelog stream for the view. Um, I'll talk about that later. Um, just for the sake of presentation, I know this is very simplistic, and you're probably not going to see that in production, but this is an example of a SQL Server database that we have to deal with. Essentially, the domain is very dumb, 
but we have a um, customer's table, and each customer has a cart, and each cart has a product. Um, the cart has the quantity, and it points to product. That's it. And a product, a product has a price. That's it. And then we had a view. Okay, and this view is very simple. It just computes uh, for a given consumer, a customer. Uh, for a given customer, we compute the, the total price for that uh, cart. Right? Very simply, we do that by just um, multiplying the price of the product uh, uh, with the quantity. Now I can talk about the change log stream because it makes more sense since we have contacts. Um, let's say that this is our SQL Server database right now. We have customer's table, customer card, products, and this is the data that we have. Now nothing is happening right now uh, because the, the customer, Josh, does not have a cart. But once we add a cart, we insert um, a cart for Josh, then the view essentially materializes it. And that's what we need, essentially. We need a change log stream uh, just like you, ha you have uh, for tables, uh, most, table, uh, most relational databases ha have um, CDC, right? So MySQL have bin log. Uh, uh, the same thing for SQL Server, you can also enable CDC. We essentially want CDC not just for tables, but for views. That's what we're trying to achieve here. And that's a very complex problem, right? So you see that I inserted a um, cart for Josh, and the quantity is two, and the price of the laptop is 300, so you multiply that by two, you get the total card value uh, 600. Then if I change the price of the laptop right, from 300 to 250, then we, also, we want to refresh that view, and we also want to get the change log, essentially what happened to that view. Right? So in this case, we had um, the total card value was materialized, materialized before it was 600, but because the price is now 250 multiplied by two, now it's 500. And you can see there you have the row kind that essentially tells you um, essentially what operation it was. So first it was insert, and then uh, after that we had the update before, and then now we have update after, right? So we want, we want that. Essentially CDC for views, right? And that was a very complex problem, and uh, my coworkers know how bad the, <laughs> it was complicated until we found Flink. We tried KSQL, it was not enough. It was lots of limitations. Um, mostly because we're trying to materialize 700 legacy SQL Server views. Nothing here was tailored for Flink, right? We're just literally copying and pasting SQL Server views and essentially um, materializing these, right? There was nothing tailored for Flink. So let's talk about Flink SQL um, because that's how we managed to do that. So the goal of Flink SQL is to essentially, um, how can I say this, is to essentially use relational algebra, SQL, right, to control and to manipulate your data streams. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about data streams here, uh, but since most of you don't know Flink, uh, you can think of data streams as FS2 streams or ZIO streams. So whenever I say data streams, you can just think of ZIO streams or FS2 streams. Um, it's not exactly the same, but it's, you, you get the idea. Uh, so the problem with uh, using uh, FS2 streams or data streams uh, streams is that I don't have a relational API. I could technically do, for example, if I want to do a left join or inner join, I could technically do that with uh, FS2 streams or ZIO streams, but the boilerplate will be immense. Right? I have to manage state myself, I have to do a lot of things myself, and the code will be just ugly. Right? And Flink SQL allows you to manipulate data streams, and you can do anything that SQL does to the data streams. So essentially, let's say you have a data stream, let's say you have a FS2 stream, and the FS2 stream is a stream of case classes, and the case class, I mean, a case class, and the case class has three fields. It has A, B, and C, and I want to project only A and B, so I want to ignore C. With Flink SQL, all I have to do is call select A, B from the, 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 the event, and that's it. So it allows me to use a relational algebra, but not for static data, not for, I mean, SQL is most of the time, I mean, all of the time is used for in relational databases, uh, but it allows us to, to do uh, SQL, use SQL 
for uh, uh, streams as well. So one thing is uh, when you when you use SQL, you query on the table, right? So that means that does Flink SQL also has tables? And the answer is yes. Flink has table. Flink SQL has tables, but the difference is that it's not tables in a relational database sense. There's no table store. Um, Flink, it's not a data, Flink SQL is not a database, essentially. Right? It does not um, have, you cannot index on the table. Instead, in Flink SQL, a table is the same thing as a stream. That's it. It's a stream that changes over time. So just for uh, visualization, you can see here I have a table on top, and you have the change log stream, and they're the same. right? Flink SQL tables are the same as uh, streams. So there's no table store. Um, there's no indexing on the table or whatever would you do at, at relational databases. Um, right, and uh, so Flink SQL tables, they can either be append only, but they can also have, uh, since they are change logs, they can have not only inserts, but they can have updates or deletes. Right. In this case, we add Josh, we had uh, for the same name, Josh, we had the money at 130. And you can see in the stream that we have a plus I that means insert. So that's the append only table. So nothing really is happening here. It's not very exciting. Same thing as I said, um, a table can contain not just insert, but it can contain update before, update after, and delete. Um, it's just to prove my point that you can't, that the table is just a data stream a change log stream, um, you can actually convert. There is this du duality between data stream, and again, you can think of data stream as, as uh, FS2 streams or ZIO streams. Um, you can convert a data stream uh, of rows to a uh, table, and uh, Flink provides a API to do that. Um, you can also use SQL to create tables. So in this case here, we use the jo uh, this Java, what's called API, of Flink to create uh, the table, but you can also use SQL to create tables. And again, as I said, um, even though I'm, I'm, it's very, it sounds very sim uh, similar to uh, creating tables in, in relation to the database, but we're just defining essentially a change log stream here, right? And um, when you create a table using SQL, you can define different connectors. So in this case, I have the Kafka connector and I have my topic, so I'm pulling data from a Kafka topic, and, and it, it, it's essentially creating a table out of a, a stream of, uh, uh, out of a Kafka topic, right? Now, usually Kafka topics, um, they are, when you pull data from a Kafka topic, you only get append only the, uh, data, because, you know, a Kafka topic, you cannot really uh, modify a, uh, a, a data that's already in the Kafka topic, but because I'm, all, I'm also using the format dbzim, then this happens. So dbzim, I think everyone here knows what dbzim is, but it provides me information uh, how the table looked like before, I mean the row looked like before, and how the, ta uh, the row looked like right now. And because of that, the table that is created has a minus u, so that's update before, so that's how it was, and that's uh, now how it is. So essentially, I can create, uh, it has a built-in support for the BISM, right? You can create tables out of uh, uh, the BISM data, which is cool. Now, uh, the most exciting thing is that you can query on the table, that's obvious, but when you query on the table in Flink SQL, you get another table, right? You get another dynamic table. And it might seem a bit like, okay, but why, so what? but this will make it look cool. So let's say I have a create table, uh, let's say I have a table shipments, and the connector doesn't really matter here, so I just abstracted the width uh, configuration, uh, but let's say it's a append-only table, right? And I pull data from the, the whatever the source is, and then I have a pen 50 that's insert, again, it's append-only, so you're only gonna have plus, plus I. And then, I'm running a query, the select item sum count. I'm running this query on the shipments table. 
And I'm doing a sum on the count. I'm also grouping by the item. But uh, again, if you're doing a sum, uh, on, there's only one pen, so the, the count is going to be 50. Right? Nothing changed here. And then I have a jar, count 10, that also goes to the, uh, to the, to the output of the query. Now, this is what's interesting, is that I have an append-only table on the left side, but then, it's the left side, yeah, of course it is for you. Uh, I have an append-only table on the left side, um, and I have an insert saying that the count of the pen is minus 15. But on the right side, I have um, an update, a change log stream, right? It doesn't only contain, it's not append-only anymore, because we're grouping by the item, Flink SQL automatically uh, does the grouping for us, right? And then I have, uh, it, it, you, you can see that it dynamically changes, the table dynamically changes. So then you have uh, minus u, that's how it was before, and then you have a plus u, and that's how it looks like right now. I mean, I could end the talk right now because that's essentially what it does. Um, I'm eagerly materializing the view right now. That's how, that's how easy Flink SQL is. I can eagerly materialize the view and get a change log for free. Right? So that's my change log right there. So essentially, that's the solution already for the problem that we had a couple months ago. That's how easy Flink SQL is. So the final solution for us looks like this. I know this is very ugly. Uh, sorry. Uh, but <laughs> we had the MySQL tables. Um, and then these went through the BSM. And then uh, we enabled CDC on the SQL Server database, of course. And then we used the BSM to pull uh, the, uh, the CDC data uh, to okay. Kafka. And then Flink, we essentially created tables, the equivalent tables from SQL Server in Flink by doing the same thing I showed you, um, create table and then I set the connector to Kafka and the format to the BSM. And then I have in the Flink catalog uh, my, my, uh, the equivalent, right? And then what I, all I have to do is run my continuous query um, and I can get a change log for free. And that's essentially what Flink does. And it supports everything, right? Flink SQL is NC compliant, so any query works. Left joins, unit joins, group by, top, everything works. You can manipulate your data streams using SQL. It's that easy. Um, there are some things we had to consider um, because SQL Server queries are not necessarily always NC compliant. There are some things that, um, exist in SQL Server, but not, don't exist in, 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 uh, uh, in Flink. An example is blocking hints, right? Or for string concatenation in SQL Server, you use plus, but in Flink, you use, I don't even know the name of that. It doesn't matter. Double <laughs> <laughs> There you go. And so all we had to do is, um, inside the code, we had a piece of code that essentially mapped uh, the SQL Server view definitions to Flink Right? And we call this the Flink Ariser. Right? And we use this library called JSQL Parser, which allows us to easily traverse a uh, query, a SQL uh, query. And do it, we do the alterations that, that we need. So essentially cleaning it so that we can use it in Flink. Another issue that we had was that some functions um, exist in SQL Server, but some functions don't exist in Flink. But Flink has support, uh, Flink has a catalog. And just like, uh, you know, most relation to databases, you have a catalog, you have views, you have schemas, you have databases, you have tables, objects. Uh, Flink also provides you the same, right? So it sounds a lot like Flink SQL is a database, but it isn't, right? It's just to facilitate uh, the manipulation of data streams. And the cool thing about Flink as well, you can, you can um, use the existing Postgres or MySQL database and import a catalog. So if you have a MySQL or Postgres database that has 100 tables and you, you don't want to have to create the create table statement for each of those, uh, Flink automatically converts a Postgres catalog or a MySQL catalog to Flink. And um, also the, the solution to the char index that exists in SQL Server but does not exist in Flink, um, Flink allows you to create UDFs, so user-defined functions. And that's, it's that easy. Um, you can use the Scala code, or it, it, they offer a Java API, which uses Scala, and you create a Scala function, the equivalent to char index. Then all you have to do is um, rest for that in the catalog, and then the following queries can use the char index. 
Now, state, because that's a very important thing. Um, some clauses do not use state, right? So for example, the select, right? It's just a projection, right? You're selecting something. There's no need to have state, stateful operators for that. Same thing where is the filter, right? And you, can, you can think of the same thing as uh, in, in uh, FS2 streams or ZIO streams, you're just filtering something. You don't need state for that, right? But there are some things like group by where Flink has to essentially create a key value uh, a map, right? And the problem with this is that you can overflow, right? Um, because depending on how large or how, you know, on the query, um, it, it just might overflow. Um, same thing. So, the, for example, that one is stateless. That does not, you don't have to worry about that state right there. This one is dangerous. Again, uh, joins as well, uh, group by aggregations. This one, you don't need to understand this. It's essentially a windowed aggregation. Um, essentially, this, there is a state, but it expires. Right? In this case, it expires after five minutes. Right? But the problem with this is that this essentially lives forever. Right? The state lives forever. There's a configuration that allows you to essentially tell Flink to expire state after how long you define. Um, but you also you have to be careful with that because if you um, if you want to ensure data consistency, you need to make sure. Let's say you have a query and you join it on two tables, and let's say that you have table A arrived, a row from table A arrived, and then but then it expired before a, a, a row from table B are, uh, arrived, and then because the row that existed in table A does not exist anymore because it got expired, it won't match. So the data won't be consistent. So in this case, we had to leave it at zero because we needed to have data consistency. Um, Flink allows you to essentially plug and play different state backends. And this was very important for us because, again, we're materializing over 700 SQL Server views. And some of them have 20 to 10 uh, joints. Um, so hash map wasn't sufficient for us. Because although it is very performance, right, we use the Java heap, um, everything is stored in Java objects, it has a limitation, which is the RAM. Right? It can overflow quite easily. So uh, Flink allows you to switch to RocksDB, which is a bit slower, uh, depending, of course, uh, on the disk that you use. Um, and, and also because you also have to serialize and deserialize um, uh, objects. But the, the, the upside is that I can use the file system. So um, if RAM uh, gets filled up, it, then the data can be spilled to disk. That's pretty much it. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much.